All right. So this week we're doing a unit on bay laurel nuts. So this is a great uh, native food pathway that we have in this area from bay laurel trees, which are super abundant. We're about halfway between the Cal Coffee Shop and the Chadwick Garden, which is right up there. We didn't even make it about 50 yards and we already found a bunch of them. These were on the road, as you see. So we're not gonna use these right off the bat, but uh, yeah, this is a bay laurel nut. It's green, it's sometimes brown after it ages. You can gather them off the ground. And as you can see, I'm just tearing it open. It's kind of like an olive. It's actually closely related to an avocado is what I just read. Um, and then you get this nice little nut which can dry out and then be roasted. When it's in this form, raw, it's extremely astringent and bitter. But once it gets roasted, it gets this wonderful chocolatey, coffee-like flavor. And they're highly nutritious as well. So, we have a huge bay laurel up above us and it's dropped all these bay laurel nuts. But we're gonna go, one thing about wild harvesting is I don't wanna get, pick up some uh, bay laurel nuts and eat some that may have oil on them or be driven over with a tire. So we're gonna go deep into the woods, not that deep. We just have to go to the upper part of Poganip and uh, we'll find a bunch, but they're all over campus. They're all over the woods, all over California. And right now is the season. They're everywhere, and it's just a matter of how much time you have. One thing you'll wanna do when you're harvesting out in the wild like this, is make sure you avoid the poison oak. This is a lot of poison oak right here, and I'm picking in and amongst it, but recognizing the leaves of three so that you're not getting poison oak because a lot of folks get poison oak during wild harvest. So learning to identify the plants that are around you is extremely important. So let's head into Poconip. All right, so you can see we got bay laurels above us. This is the first 100 yards of the Poconip Trail. The path is carpeted with these. All around the ground here, it's all bay laurel nuts. We don't want to harvest these though because people have been walking on them. They might have dog poop on their feet. They might have other types of feces. So we want to avoid things that people are walking on. So we're going to find a spot off the trail. I think we're going to go down to the koi pond and look around there. I know there are a few bay laurels near the koi pond, but just wanted to show you these are virtually everywhere, all across. You just want to find an area of the forest that has bay laurel trees. One other thing I want to add too is this is the first significant rain of the year. Um, it's soaking the ground. Normally, if I was out here, I'd be looking for a couple things. I'd be looking for bay laurel nuts and wild mushrooms. Um, chanterelles, uh, horn of plenty, uh, chicken of the woods mushrooms, all could be out here. But normally uh, in central California, you have to wait until the first rain happens about two weeks after. The ground needs to get saturated, that activates the mycelia, and we'll start getting fruiting flushes around Thanksgiving. So hopefully Thanksgiving might be the first bleats of the year. Um, and I'm really excited about that. But we're gonna keep an eye out. Uh, tan oak and scrub brush, huckleberry, these are all signs for the edible varieties that uh, are around this time of year. So we're in the right type of forest where you could potentially find some wild mushrooms. Uh, the caveat with wild mushrooms is I really recommend moving one species at a time. Uh, start with a simple species that doesn't have a lot of poison uh, lookalikes, uh, poisonous lookalikes. Um, and a great book uh, by David Aurora that's really small, a little bigger than his Mushrooms Demystified Compendium, is All That the Rain Promises and More. And the cover is him with a trumpet picking chanterelles under an oak in the music meadow here at UCSC. It's actually a really great book and it is a great introduction to the, the species that you might be looking for. But I like to personally add one species per season. Um, so last year I got my first curriculum and that was really delicious. So I like to add I, my first year ever hunting mushrooms when I was about 15, I hunted black trumpets. And then the next year I added golden chanterelles. And the year after that I added oyster mushrooms and bolets. And slowly over the years I've added, and now I have about 15 species that I'm comfortable harvesting. So that's how I personally do it. And it feels really safe that way. Um, there are easier species to recognize. You don't want to look for little brown mushrooms until you're an advanced mushroom hunter. So you want to start off with chanterelles, bolets, then oysters are the next level up because they have gills and they have um, a poisonous lookalike. So you need to take a spore print to verify that they're true oysters. So anyway, that's a little tangent on uh, the wild harvest. But always be looking when you're out in the forest. There are all kinds of edible things out here. So you can slowly expand what you know how to harvest. And while you're looking for one thing, you might find another. So let's go on a little further. 
All right, so this is a massive bay laurel we're under. One of these beautiful ones set into the side of the trail, the pile of rocks behind it. We're off the trail a little bit, so there's not as much to worry about footprint and foot tread, and the ground is loaded here. I've got a harvesting bag. Um, this is normally for apple picking, but you can use it for all kinds of wild harvests. What's really nice is that you can unclip and the bottom opens and you can drop out your harvest later, but you can use whatever kind of bag you want. It's nice to have something that hangs so you have both hands to pick with. So when I'm picking, I'm looking on the ground here for ones that aren't rotten. So like, especially cause it's raining right now, this is a rotten one. I squeeze it, it's juicy. You don't want that. So you can check while you're out here by squeezing. See, I squeeze the nut out, it's still nice and hard. So you want to just kind of get, you'll get a feel for it as you harvest what is a good nut and what's not. You should move a little more slowly at first until you get used to it, but really you just want to make sure you don't have any mold. And if they're popping out really easily, you might as well just, I squeeze them out straight into my bag here, but you don't have to peel them as you go. Right now, because it's raining, they're at like just the perfect thing where you can squeeze them out. When they're a little younger, they're actually a lot more difficult, kind of like a Castel Valtrano olive. They're a little more difficult to squeeze out, but now they just are popping right out. So we're loaded here. We can pick all day. So I'm just squeezing from here and just getting rid of the rind. So this is pre-shucked. So depending on what you're making, you're gonna want, um, you know, if you just want a few to snack on, they have really strong flavor. Um, but if you're making a mole sauce like we are, mole keeps for a very long time. So you might want to make your mole sauce for the season. It'll last all winter in the fridge if you take good care of it. So it really depends on your capacity and your time. And that applies to a lot of wild harvest things. These are preserved items. Also, if you roast them, they'll store for a really long time. Lastly, if you actually shuck them and wash them and dry them, you can leave them as nuts unroasted and that's how they'll keep the best and then you can roast them when you're ready to eat them so it's really about how many you think you're going to eat or share it's a great christmas gift because it's a very special item so this is a great way to get a free christmas gift and you can spend hours doing it it's really about time capacity and valuing your own time but if you enjoy doing this like i do you know i i spend about four hours a week doing wild harvest activities around my home um, and stocking my house with lots of wild harvest and gleaning goods. So there's a lot of free stuff out here if you're willing to take the time to find it and bring it home and preserve it. So now that we've got a bag full of bay laurel nuts, we're gonna head back to the cafe and we're gonna roast them off for our mole. So we took our uh, bay nuts, we shucked them, and we tossed them in the oven to roast. It's been about an hour and 20 minutes or so at 350 to 375. That is in a convection oven though. So just noted here that we have air moving. Convection means that there's a fan running while this is going. So it's gonna be, take a longer time. So the way I can tell that these are done is that I've got a few of these, they're very hot, so I have to be careful here. I'll grab a pair of tongs. But I could see a couple of these were splitting open and getting black. And I could see through on a few of them as they're starting to discard their shell, they're nice and brown. You can see there, that's a nice, rich brown here. And what we'll do, I'll grab a cutting board and chop one of these up so you can see. So before I pulse all of them, it's always good to check and see. We lost about half of it there. You can see, ooh, they're very hot. Um, but I got a little piece here. I can see that it's brown all the way through. So I'm gonna give it a taste and see if it's ready. Mm. It's such an interesting flavor. It's, it's bitter, but chocolatey and like coffee-like. You definitely need sweet to balance it. 
I could eat these straight, but I have a high capacity for bitter. Bitter isn't necessarily a flavor that Americans are super used to, so that's uh, something to keep in mind. Um, these shells are fine, still on here. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna pulse this in our food processor. Um, this is a big old food processor, but really it's just a large version of that. If you didn't have a food processor, you can rough chop these or grind them up in a molcajete um, or use a blender uh, or use a coffee grinder. So there's a lot of different things you can do here, but for our purposes, we're gonna use our robo -tool. Would not believe the smell that's coming off of this right now. It's so rich and coffee-like. So if you look in here, we're getting there. I'm gonna run it longer. All right, so now it's done. I definitely got some shell in here as well. I'm wondering if I should have let it rest and cool down um, to separate out the shell prior but I don't think that's really necessary because what I'm gonna do is try to use a sifter once this dries out. So let's see here, I'm gonna move over to the cutting board. So I've got a sifter here and two bowls. So I'm gonna take this. One thing with uh, food processors, always keep your finger on the um, blade because it'll fall out on you and they're very sharp. Then as you don't want things to go to waste, rubber spatulas are your friends in kitchens. So now I'm going to remove the blade. I'm going to scrape off the blade a bit. Make sure that we're getting all those hard earned nuts here. So looking at this, because it's still hot, there's definitely some moisture in here. So what I want to do before I try to strain this out, is I want to dry it out a little further. So I'm going to take a piece of parchment paper and a baking sheet. I'm gonna spread it out on there. All right, so now taking my parchment paper, folding it, putting it on the edge here. We got two pieces. Parchment paper is just gonna make it easier for it to come off. If I put it straight on the tray, it might stick to the tray a bit. I'm going to spread this out on my two trays to dry. And I can still feel it's really warm. This is giving it a chance early to not get dense and get moist and clump together. All right, so now I've got my two trays. And what I want to do is either put them back in the oven at a really low temperature. I don't want to cook them. I'm just trying to dry them out. The oven's already still hot. I actually have the fortune of having a dehydrator here in the kitchen. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put them in at 140 degrees for like two hours. And then after that, I'm gonna just filter it through here, get out all of these shells, and then I will have this powder, and that powder I can use as a base in mole, the same way I'd make chocolate. I can mix it together with some sugar and use it to make a, a beverage. There's all kinds of ways, but now we've processed our bay nuts and they're ready to be used in a variety of ways. You can keep them whole and use whole roasted bay nuts, but I find this powder to be uh, really useful. And then once it's like this, and as long as you've kept the moisture out, because remember that moisture is a vector for contamination, you can store it in a jar in a cool, dry, dark place for the whole winter, um, probably until next season. And it'll go a really long way, but this is a great, beverage or for moles or for sauces um, and really enriching and giving some bitterness and balance and chocolatey roasty flavors you could even mix it into your coffee to enrich your coffee so there's a lot that can be done here baking um, treat it like you would cocoa powder um, like a dark um, unsweetened cocoa powder and then you can swap it out there and it actually has a lot more nutritional value than um, chocolate um, although I do think chocolate has magical restorative properties as well. So that is your bay laurel nut. And uh, thanks for coming along on a harvest with us today.